Hey, my name is Barbie Armenta. I'm a wife, mother, life coach, and founder of Brave One. Everyone has a story, and I believe that you can be inspired in your own life by hearing another woman's courageous story. We are here to talk about purpose, identity, divorce, blending families. If you're talking about it, I want to talk about it. We are here to have brave conversations. Welcome back to Brave Conversations. I am so excited for you to meet my guest today. Her name is Elizabeth Clark Hoverman. She's a singer, songwriter, vocal coach, worship arts consultant, and worship leader. Her most popular song, When I Speak Your Name, has been sung all over the world and recorded by Carrie Job, Amy Perry, and it was featured with Gateway Church and Daystar Worship. Elizabeth lives in Fort Worth, Texas, with her husband TJ and their six children. I was blessed to meet Elizabeth about four years ago, and a few weeks ago, she led worship for the Brave Gathering for the third time. So welcome to the podcast, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I am so excited that you're here, and I love you, and I can't wait for everyone else to uh, get to know you as well. I know if anyone attended the Brave Gathering, they have already got to be blessed by hearing you sing, but now they get to hear a little bit about your story. So let's just start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and all the things. I am from originally Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I grew up and lived there for about 20 years. And um, then after that, felt called to come to um, Christ for the Nations in Dallas, Texas. And um, went there for almost, let's see, about three semesters. And didn't graduate, but um, that ch- that church, I'm sorry, that that Bible college was very, very intricate in um, in my life, in part of my life. Yeah. So you're from Mississippi. Yes. So were you a musical family? Did you do you come by that from your from your parents? Where did music start for you? My mom um, sings and plays the piano. And so growing up, I watched her in church sing either onto a soundtrack or at the piano. And she wasn't a songwriter. I think she wanted to be, but she just didn't ever develop the knack for it, as she would say. But she was really my inspiration. I remember as a kid being in church services, watching her perform or and sing to the Lord. And I was just really in awe of who she was as a person, and also um, her ability to do what she did. And I just, I just remember being awestruck and thinking that would be cool to do that someday. That is so fun. So were you that kid with the hairbrush in the mirror singing in your bedroom? Yes. <laughs> Actually, I was that kid on the fireplace standing up there with whatever I could find um, as an, a microphone <laughs> in singing and pretending that I was leading worship. Um, so I did that and I loved it. And I might even had my Barbie dolls up there um, on the fireplace with me. And um, then Salty's Kids Praise was a really cool thing back then, a blue book singing songs. Um, and I used to rewind the songs over and over again, just listen to them because I loved it so much. And my mom taught me how to play the piano when I was seven. And, um, and then from there on, I learned from not just her, she's like, after a certain point, she's like, um, you just need to learn from somebody else. I can't do this anymore. Um, so she allowed, um, a few other piano teachers to teach me along the way. So do you play other instruments? You know, I picked up guitar once in my early 20s to try to give a different vibe for songwriting. I started songwriting when I was 14. And so when I began that journey, it was strictly just the piano. Um, But as I got older, I wanted to be inspired by other instruments because you get a whole different inspiration, even if it's an electronic keyboard to a grand piano. Um, there's just something about sitting down at a grand piano that just get, for me, I just get so inspired by. So fast forward to when I, my college days, I tried, you know, how hard can this be? Oh my goodness. The calluses to build up on, for the guitar, it hurts so bad, but it was worth trying, you know, something different. And then occasionally I would lead worship from the guitar, but I haven't really played in a while. So I just 
decided to stick to the piano. <laughs> it was much easier and easier on my fingers. So yeah. So at what point did you start singing for someone other than your Barbie dolls? When did you get, <laughs> first get in front of an audience? Actually, it was 10. Um, I had a solo at our our church, at, um, and it was a, a bunch of kids. It was a kids program. And um, I remember the title of that performance was Agapaopolis, which is such a funny name. So that's why I remembered it, because it was just amusing. And um, anyway, so it was a play, musical type of production. And then after that, um, sometimes on Sunday evenings at my grandmother's church in Alabama, they would have these um, singing nights or where you would, anybody could sing whatever they wanted. Um, and so I was about 11 or 12 when I started singing like Amy Grant songs. And, um, and I had a lot of fun doing that. I, I loved doing that. But um, so that's where, you know, I guess you could say it all started as far as um, getting on stage. And I wasn't all that great at it. I, I really wasn't. I just loved doing it. I was okay, but I kept trying to, I just loved pouring out my heart to God. Um, and so that's what kept me going, doing it. I love that. So then you come to Texas. Yeah. And what was that like here for you outside of, of school? What is, what was your personal life like? Well, um, it looked a lot like you know, coming to college here, I was looking for direction at that time from, I knew I had been doing music ministry prior to that, traveling with my parents and doing some things. One, see you at the poll rallies, conferences, things of that nature, um, actually even opened up for Big Daddy Weave. That's um, awesome. I, it was really cool. But that was way before they were known and popular. It was see you at the poll rallies, you know, things like that. So leading up to um, coming to Texas, I remember asking God, you know, is this all there is? I mean, I didn't want to stay in Mississippi. I didn't feel like, I really just didn't feel like I belonged there. It was just, have you, I don't know if you've ever felt like, Hey, uh, this is, this doesn't feel like I fit in or I don't belong. I just really felt like that for a long time, even as a teenager. And I didn't see them being opportunities there for me and what I wanted to do. And, um, so, um, I, when I prayed and asked God for which direction to go, um, going back when I was in Mississippi, I was working part-time at office depot. And I remember sitting at the red light and I'm like, I really want to get out of Dodge. <laughs> and God said, I'm not moving you anywhere until you are content with where I have you. And I remember that as clear as day. I'm like, oh, okay, yes, sir. You know, <laughs> you got it. So I began to look for the opportunities to be Jesus where I was and be content with where God had me. And then I, it would be about three years later that the Lord moved me to Texas. And I was, again, I was looking to further my education in theology. I was looking to, uh, for those next steps of um, how do, where do I go from here? I love leading worship. I love writing songs. How do I mix all of that together? What do I do next? Um, just really just looking for direction. So that's why I came to Bible college. And while I was there, one of the professors who has passed away now, but at the time, uh, he was one of the professors there, um, teachers, and, um, he believed in me and, and loved me. And he said, um, that he had an opportunity for me to be a worship um, pastor interim. And so I got my first worship pastor interim job at a church actually in Hearst. And, um, so that, that began my journey of searching and looking for whatever God had for me next. And so that's what it looked like. And then, um, not too long, I was at, in Texas, probably like a year. Then I met my first husband. So, yeah. So I love that you talked about not feeling like you fit in and then God asking you to be content because mm -hmm. I think that's such a good lesson for all of us. You know, we want to jump to the next thing. Yeah. And sometimes he's like, just slow down, you know, and maybe he's still preparing that next step. And we, it doesn't make sense in the process. I know how many times I have been in the middle <laughs> and been like, 
if we could just hurry this along. Yes. <laughs> and so that's such an inspiration, I think, for us hearing that and knowing that, you know, God blesses that when we will, sometimes he just wants us to stop and be still. And yeah. so that's good. So you met your first husband. Yes, I did. And we met and married pretty fast within about four or five months. And um, there, um, I, I thought things were great. Um, I, I think leading up to the wedding, though, there was an increase of arguing, and my my dad had seen some warning. There were warning signs that he tried to um, show me, and he actually wanted me to call the wedding off two weeks before. And I said, oh, no. And, and my first thought was, what are people going to think? Um, why, am, why would I call a wedding off two weeks before? He had a daughter, and she was three. And she had already began to call me mom. And um, her her mother wasn't, was around, but wasn't around, if that makes sense. Um, and so I had really developed a, a love for her and already and, and her dad. And so I, you know, like my dad doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, that was also my thought, like everything's fine. And I, we got married and I would say after the honeymoon, it was over. Um, the honeymoon was over. And um, and then began a life of continuing on, um, doing what I was doing, leading worship, traveling, singing, um, having kids. And throughout that, the marriage, hoping that things would change. He became um, very verbally abusive and at times physically abusive. And for 10 years, I put up with that. And because, and I was asked, why did you, why were you hanging around so long? Why didn't you get help? First of all, I didn't know I needed help. Second of all, even though I asked God to open up my eyes and open up my ears, I was still like, it was like a veil was still over my eyes that where I still couldn't see um, what was right in front of me. I knew things weren't right in the home. I knew things were lots of turmoil and, you know, one week to another, you just never know what was going to happen. Um, but I, I kept living my life, praying, believing, hoping things would change. And so because I held to that belief and I didn't believe in divorce, like I love God. Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't believe in divorce. You know, my parents are still together and loving marriage. And, um, and I never in a million years, I mean, no one ever goes into marriage thinking I'm going to get divorced. Um, I mean, that would be weird anyway, if you did, but, um, so for me, it was just a journey of trying to, um, figure a way for things to be fixed. You know, I wanted things fixed. I wanted things better. Um, but it, things didn't get better. And I, I realized that I couldn't, is I couldn't change or force change upon him. He had to want it. And I remember asking him, do you, you know, will you get help? He's like, no, I don't need help. And I begged for him to get help. I knew though that my mind had become so frail and so torn that I needed help. So I began to seem like, well, if he's not going to get help, I'm going to get help because I feel like I'm going crazy here. Um, and I actually considered um, checking myself into a psych ward because that's how fragile my mind had been become. And I felt like if anything else happened, it was just going to, I was just going to break. And, um, so one day he said, um, you know, he has all, he was also on amphetamines. He had been on for his whole life because of ADHD, but he had taken too much and different kinds and even took taken some of mine that I was on, um, that I didn't want to be on, but he told me, you know, you need to be on medication. And I believed him and, so it turned out I really didn't need medication for that. Um, but however, so one day, um, things just started escalating pretty heavily and, um, I felt, um, pretty unsafe. And so because of that, I felt like it was time for me to pack my bags and take the kids and leave. I couldn't take my oldest daughter with me, Megan, um, who I really, really, uh, love just as much as my natural born children because she was, um, you know, more of her dad's than 
she was me. And it was very difficult to leave her behind. Um, and I remember her looking at me um, with questions in her eyes, like, why are you leaving me? And, um, and I told her how much I wanted to, but I just, I couldn't because, um, she belonged to her dad and she didn't really understand. She was about 12 or 13. And so, um, you know, that was, that was really, really tough because I know that she felt abandoned and she felt rejected and I didn't want to cause her to feel that way, but, um, she did. And, um, so anyways, I, I just es escaped the situation with my, my four children and thus began the journey to try to, um, get the help that I needed with counseling and, and take care of the children and, and hopes also that their dad would get the help that he needed. Um, because I, I still wanted hope, healing and freedom to happen in our family. And I was trying to do what I felt like was best. And I even asked God, is this okay? Are, are you okay with me doing this? And I just felt like the Lord kept saying, yeah, I, I'm blessing you this, this situation. I'm blessing your choice to, to do this because this is not what I want for you. I don't, I don't want the chaos. I don't want the destruction. I don't want what is happening in your family and your life to happen. Um, and God wanted healing for us even more than we wanted it. And so, um, it really hurt having to leave and it was very, very difficult leaving the situation. And then, you know, having a few, uh, having a pastor help rescue me, my parents helped a whole lot, but, um, and I prayed for miracles. I prayed and I prayed and I asked God for miracles and he is a miracle working God, and I believed it. I sang about it. I read about it in the Bible, and I believed it would happen. And all the things that I asked God for, um, here we are about eight years later, if not a little bit more, and God really has done the miracles in his life, in my life, and brought so much healing and so much freedom and now to this day, their dad and I get along and God's changed his life. And he even thanked me one time for actually leaving. And he said, you, by you leaving, it actually opened my eyes to realize I didn't actually know God. Mm. And, um, and I'll never forget that day, the day that we actually talked on the phone after we had gotten divorced a year after all of that had happened. But yeah, um, you know, he's still, you know, after so many years and a, and a long process, change finally came, miracles finally came, restoration came with the, the daughter that I, st I still like to call her my daughter. Um, and she's, you know, married now and, um, and I'm so proud of her. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just really cool to see the miracles that's also happened in my kids because they went through so much trauma and, and I know that um, their sister did too. And just the healing, the miracles, the restoration, the redemption, God can do it. I mean, he's the only one who can change um, a person completely. And I've seen it firsthand in my own life, in my children and in my ex-husband. And it is so awesome, so awesome to see that happen and God giving me the desires of my heart in that area. Thank you so much for sharing that with such vulnerability, because I know so many women will resonate with that idea of people saying, why did you stay? Mm -hmm. You know, and that you were still had that hope and yeah. that when, um, things did escalate and you were able to feel that release, yeah. um, from God, because he does want protection for you. And I know so many women will be, um, encouraged and just, feel hope in their own shame, because I know from going through a similar experience, yeah. um, how you feel when you leave, because you do feel guilt and you feel shame and you yeah. feel all those things for your kids being in that situation, but then taking them out of that, you know, yeah. it feels like a no win sometimes. And for you to be able to have walked through that and then see God's goodness on the other side, you know, I'm just so grateful. 
for you Absolutely. sharing. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think sharing stories are, are just really important because so many times we feel like we're alone or we're, we're the only ones going through this or going through that, or how can anybody understand? And, and really, unless you've been through certain situations, you can't completely understand what someone's facing or what someone's going through. Empathy is very important and making sure that you are um, having compassion on those who are hurting and who are broken, even if you haven't been in their situation, because every single one of us cannot escape disappointment. We cannot escape um, death that happens around us. We can't escape bad things that happen to us, but we can accept that God is still good in the middle of all the mess and that he has not changed and he doesn't fail. You know, some people like, well, didn't God fail you? No, absolutely not. I never once felt like God failed me. Now, did I feel like I was left a abandoned and like on an island to die, you know, that was my emotions being dramatic at one point. And I think God is okay with us getting upset and just letting him have it. He can take it. I think sometimes we think, oh, we can't talk like that or we can't do like that to God. Um, he, he made us, he knows our emotions. He knows what we need and just venting to the Lord. He wants and desires that. Well, speaking of God giving you the desires of your heart, um, what happened next? Well, <laughs> so many cool things happened next. I was when I was on my journey to healing. Um, I, the Lord said He He needed a, a year to do the things He needed to do inside of me, and so during that time, I even tried to find a job because I did, I needed I needed income. My parents were very helpful during that time, um, but I could never get a job. And I'm like, all I knew was ministry, you know, working in a church, singing songs. The last time I had a, a real job in a corporate setting was at Office Depot, like so many years ago. Like, I don't even know what to do. I felt um, like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? Um, I didn't have a degree, you know, all of the things. So it was such a crazy time, it was such a hard time. But every, every time I tried to find a job, um, just door closed one right after the other. And so when that, towards that year, um, of healing was almost up, I had put my job application out there, um, on churchstaffing.com and I've got a, um, a phone call, um, from a church in Benbrook, Texas, Restoration Family Church. And they said they wanted to interview me and they did. And then, they, uh, it was a phone, it's actually a FaceTime call. <laughs> it was awesome. Then they said, well, can we fly you in this weekend? So I did. And on the way over there, um, flying over there, I heard the Lord say, I'm bringing you back to Texas. That was my desire. I was in Mississippi for a little while and I wanted to go back and I'm like, all right. So he just kept confirming it over and over again. So I, I actually, at this specific point in my life, um, I had felt so much shame. I was dealing with so much shame still and guilt um, and of being divorced, being a divorced worship leader who, you know, served in the church um, because there's so much scrutiny that goes on um, when you we live in a glass house, when you are on pastoral staff and serving. And it's and it's very it is it's not as easy. People think that it's a glamorous life. And it's actually a nitty gritty life. We love doing what we do, but it is a very difficult job. And um, so <laughs> I just, I, re I recall just still dealing with some of those um, feelings like, are, is a church really going to accept a divorced single mom? And they did. And the way they loved me and accepted me and they offered me the job, it was like, wow, it, and it was so timely that the name of the church was Restoration. And God was doing that in my life. And I was there one month and I met this guy of all places on eHarmony. <laughs> I had I had talked to a few other guys on there, just kind of, I'd made fun of eHarmony, thought it was silly, you know. So I'm like, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to see what the fuss is all about. 
but it wasn't me being like serious. Um, I didn't know if I'd ever want to actually get remarried from what I'd been through. Um, so that was a lot of questions to answer yeah, to deal with the harmony. <laughs> yes, it was a lot. Um, and like, if you're thorough, they do a really good job of matching you. Let me tell you, because um, I met my now husband on there and he really is um, a match made in heaven, <laughs> as they would say. Um, and we've been married uh, six and a half years, almost seven. And he is an absolutely incredible man of God who is so patient and loving and kind. He is more um, than I really thought I could ever hope for, imagine, or dream. And I love him more now than I did when we got married. I mean, it's just, he's awesome. And how many kids do you have? We have six between the two of us. And it is a wild, crazy, fun household. <laughs> and one of them is in college now. So um, we have five remaining at home, which kind of feels a little weird. And the puppy. Yeah, and the puppy, um, Rafa. He, you know, Rafa means healing. And so he has brought some of that to us um, with his little sweet self. Um, but yeah. So I know a little bit about you. So I know that you and your husband have um, a karaoke ministry. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Tell us a little bit about that. Everybody that knows me knows that I love karaoke. It's so much fun. Um, some people get mad at me because they're like, why are you here singing? Um, this karaoke is, is for people who can't sing. And I'm like, well, okay. It's actually for people who like to have fun and sing, you know, it doesn't matter if you're good or not. Um, it's just, it's just neat to hear people singing songs and having a good time. Do you have a go-to? Yeah. Um, there's several different ones. It depends. Sometimes I ask my husband, okay, which song should I do? He's like, well, what are you feeling in the mood for? I'm like, I don't know. I could do a pop country old song. I could do Aretha Franklin, um, respect, you know, which one do you want? And cause sometimes I'm undecided. Um, but sometimes it's, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston or At Last by Etta James. Um, just kind of pretend, you know, it pertains to what I'm feeling like I should do that night. Or maybe the crowd. Maybe the crowd is really liking country tonight. So I might do um, Anyway by Martina McBride. It talks about God in there and I really like it. So, but I don't, I always make sure that I sing songs that don't compromise my faith because I truly believe that's important as someone who really loves God with all their heart. I don't want to sing things that I wouldn't say or believe myself. So I, I have to be more careful what I sing. But um, yeah, we, we've met some incredible people by going to, we've, uh, to karaoke and been able to minister to people who are broken and hurting. Um, pray for people, even this one couple, for instance, um, they had had way too much to drink, but we were playing darts with them. And she explained to me her desire to have kids. And, um, and I felt like God said, you know what, just pray for her, ask her if you can pray for her. And so I asked her, I said, would you mind if I prayed for you to have children? And she said, uh, sure. Now her husband seemed kind of uncomfortable with the idea because he was over there on the, off to the side playing darts with my husband. And so um, I just prayed a bold prayer and and believed that God was going to heal her and give her children because they'd had trouble. I didn't see them after that for quite some time. Like, oh, maybe we scared them off. I would literally say it was about eight, maybe even nine months later. They walk into the place and... Um, my husband noticed that they were there and he said, wait, isn't that the couple that you prayed for like last year? I said, yeah. I'm, he said, I'm pretty sure I see a baby bump. And I'm like, no way. And so I looked and sure enough, she was pregnant, good, good and pregnant. And I'm like, wow, look at you, God. And, and I, I'm pretty sure they, they don't actually know God and they still tried to avoid seeing God. But I can look at that and go, that's you, God. You still did that. You did that. And it's just really cool to be able to 
have the opportunity to go in and meet people who, um, even people who used to walk with God, who fell away. And this one lady recently said, um, through karaoke ministry, she said she used to be worship leader and she came back to the Lord recently. And she said, Elizabeth, you're a big part of how I came back to the Lord. Like, wow, all through karaoke. So yeah. Meeting people where they are. Yes. I love it. Exactly. We have new music coming out. Yes. I'm a little partial to one of the songs. (laughs) I wonder why. (laughs) So one day after church, I said to you, what if the Brave Gathering had its own song? And you said, it doesn't work that way, Barbie. (laughs) (laughs) But then what happened? (laughs) Well, okay. So I, I remember that conversation and I remember the look on your face too, like, okay, well, all right, fine. You know, type of thing in your, (laughs) the, in your nice, your nice face look. And so I remember going home that week and just walking around the house thinking about different things. And I was thinking about our conversation. So during that, that time, these words started to come to mind. I'm like, huh. And I felt like God said, just go get on the piano. I'm like, okay, cool. Sat there, got the, f- the first little diddlies in. I'm like, this is a little different than anything that I have written before. And it felt fun. And I felt like the song, if it was going to be a theme song for the Brave Gathering, it needed to be peppy, you know, not a somber. I like to write dramatic songs and everybody says that minor keys are my favorite. Well, they're not wrong. So it was uh, very, um, very cool to sit down and figure this out. And it didn't take long for that first little bit to come out. And I remember sending you the little memo and, and like, Hey, what do you think about this so far? Because if you don't like it, I'm not going to go further with this. And I, and I meant that as I'm going to go a different direction um, musically, if this isn't what you're thinking or feeling. And I don't know what you thought on that side of things, but (laughs) I just remember thinking, you know, um, I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to write a theme song for somebody, um, I want it to be something that resonates with them. So then what did you say? You sent me just, just a melody and I was humming it like the rest of the day. Mm. And so there were no words yet. And I was like, yes, <laughs> just keep going. That's right. Yes, it, that's true. So I think it was done in a matter of, of a few weeks. It was quick. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And then it just um, progressed from there and just kept um, evolving into getting better. It was awesome. I listened to that rough version in my car over and over, <laughs> and I would go through the house and catch my husband singing it. That's so <laughs> and he's funny. like, well, it's catchy. It's for sure That's catchy. That's awesome. That's when you know you write a good song is when people are singing it over and over in a little part that goes do, 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 you know? Um, my, my mom will sometimes just send me a text and do, 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 you know, and <laughs> she's like, I'm singing it. And I'm like, it's, it's so cute. I love it. My mom and my dad both, you know, well, I love it. It's been so much fun just to watch the evolution of this song. And just a few weeks ago, you got to sing it yes. um, at the Brave Gathering. Everyone's been talking about it ever since. And so you have more new music, though. It's just part of a complete EP. So tell us kind of the rest of that. Yes, this EP that is coming out was scheduled to come out in the fall, but we've had to push it back. So it's going to be in more towards the winter time. But um, it's two more songs added to this EP that I'm really excited about. And they're part of my story. And as well as other people's stories, one of the songs that are that is on there. It's called run to Jesus, or if you're going to run, run to Jesus. And that song was written, um, actually an inspiration by my sister-in-law and someone else that I know that have gone through some really tough times. And my heart was really just hurting and broken for what they were going through. And about a year ago is when I just decided to write a song um, that when there's a lot of times in life when people go through some really dark uh, moments or dark times, you have this tendency just to want to run away from it all. 
Um, I don't know how many times I've felt that way. I don't know about you, but there's been times like, oh, I'll just, let me just run away from all of this. I, I can't handle this. It's just too much. But the whole idea for the song is it, but if you're going to run, run to Jesus because he's been through every single thing, every single bit of pain that you could ever feel or ever go through. He's already been there and paid for it. And so his arms are wide open. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, about that one too. And then the other one has to do with my own story about traps along my journey that became invisible graves. That's part of the, the lyrics. Um, and, and having hopes of getting out before it was too late. And then it just talks about how light broke through and came at the time, just at the time that I needed it to. And and it talks about courage. And so I, I'm really, really excited to be able to share this with people, especially those who are feeling those things right now. So, yeah. I love the position of all of those songs together that you're going to encourage them to brave on. Yes. And then... Um, and run to Jesus and that you're, it's called my story, yes. which I absolutely love because everyone has a story and that they can step into part of your story and see themselves and then, um, just be encouraged and inspired along the way. So I cannot wait for it to come out, but you have a sneak peek, right? Yes, I do. I sure do have a sneak peek. If everybody, um, wants a sneak peek of it, all they got to do is, go to my website and put their email address in and then they can get a sneak peek. They can download it or listen to it, either one. Awesome. And that is Brave On. Yes. It's my on. personal favorite. Yay. So we will put everything in the show notes so that they can go and uh, click the link, get to your website, um, download the song, and they can be singing it in their car every day <laughs> um, while they're waiting for the other songs to come out. So I have one last question for you that I ask all my guests. So you can ask you can answer this in a serious way, funny way, whatever works for you. But what is the most brave thing you've ever done? The most brave thing I have ever done. Okay. My, my most brave moment I would say is really right now because I'm in transition to, um, stepping out and formed my own LLC and um, I am going out there and taking a risk to be an entrepreneur. That was not something that I ever dreamed about doing. I, I just knew music, music, music. And, but now I'm wanting, I'm taking it to the next level and going to continue doing what I've been doing with vocal coaching, consulting with churches that need help with certain things. And then... Um, also doing some vocal coaching or sharing how I write songs and that sort of thing. So yeah, right now we're, we're about to step out in faith and take a big leap. So for me, this is my most brave moment right now. I love that. I'm beyond excited for you. I'm so excited for you to get all this music out into the world. Uh, so everyone can know how amazing you are. Thank you. So we will definitely be cheering you on. Thank so, you so much. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Today. Oh, yeah. It's been my pleasure, as they say at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining me for today's conversation. If this resonated with you, please save this podcast to your playlist and share it with your friends. If there's a conversation that you want to hear, make sure and reach out at braveone.net and send a topic request. Until our next episode, remember to put your brave on.